Hello and welcome to Earth Science, Lecture 16, Heating the Atmosphere. The universe is made up of a combination of matter and energy. The concept of matter is easy to grasp because it is the stuff that we can see, smell, and touch. Energy, on the other hand, is an abstract and therefore more difficult subject to describe. For our purposes, we define energy simply as the capacity to do work. We can think of work as being accomplished whenever matter is moved. You are likely familiar with some of the common forms of energy, such as thermal, chemical, nuclear, and radiant or light, and gravitational energy. One type of energy is described as kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. Recall that matter is composed of atoms or molecules that are constantly in motion and therefore possess kinetic energy. Heat is a term that is commonly used synonymously with the term thermal energy. In this usage, heat is the energy possessed by a material arising from the internal motions of its atoms or molecules. Whenever a substance is heated, its atoms move faster and faster which leads to an increase in its heat content. Temperature, on the other hand, is related to the average kinetic energy of a material's atoms and molecules. Heat refers to the quantity of energy present, whereas temperature refers to the intensity or degree of hotness. Heat and temperature are closely related concepts. Heat is the energy that flows because of temperature differences. In all situations, though, heat is transferred from warmer to cooler, excuse me, to cooler objects. Thus, if two objects of different temperature are in contact, the warmer object will become cooler, and the cooler object will become warmer until they both reach the same temperature. Consider two different size containers of water that are both at the same temperature as of 90 degrees Celsius. The liter of water containing more, uh, the liter of water, excuse me, contains more internal energy because it will require more ice cubes to cool it. So as a result, there's more heat. So before we move on, I just wanted to throw in one graphic here to help us uh, as we move forward. Um, so there are three main temperature scales that we're going to look at. Degrees Fahrenheit, which was developed in the early 1700s by G. Daniel Fahrenheit, uh, are used to record surface temperatures uh, by meteorologists in the United States. However, since most of the rest of the world uses degrees Celsius, which was developed later in the 18th century, it is important to be able to convert from one to the other. So here we can see the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius. There's an equation that relates the two that we won't get into, at least for now. But it has common things here, like uh, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. Um, and things like that. But it also shows a third scale called the Kelvin scale. Now, Kelvin is very important in the sciences because it begins at absolute zero, which is the lowest possible temperature, and as a result, there are no negative values. Uh, so this scale is actually what we most often use in astronomy. So I wanted to put this out there because you're going to hear me using kind of all three of these temperature scales throughout the rest of the course. So this could just serve as a reference for you to come back to if you ever get confused by one temperature scale versus another. Moving on. The flow of energy can occur in three ways. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Although they are all presented separately, all three mechanisms of heat transfer can operate simultaneously. In addition, working in tandem, these processes may transfer heat between the sun and earth and between the Earth's surface, the atmosphere, and outer space. So at this point, please pause the video and watch the video linked in the YouTube description or at the following web address. This one will show you the different types of energy transfer. But we will step through them as well. Conduction is familiar to all of us. Anyone who has touched a metal spoon that was left in a hot pan has discovered that heat was conducted through the metal spoon. Conduction is the transfer of heat through matter by molecular activity. The energy of molecules is transferred through 
collisions from one molecule to another, with the heat flowing from one area of higher temperature to that of lower temperature. So here's a great example showing these images. A solid is held in a flame. The molecules uh, in the warmed end vibrate violently. This increased energy of vibration is passed on to the adjacent slower molecules, which also begin to vibrate more. The increase in activity thus moves from molecule to molecule, causing the region of increased activity to extend along the rod. So here's the outside view, temperature higher on one end, lower on the other, and this is a molecular view, showing the increased vibrations because they're hot and that energy radiates downward. The ability of a substance to conduct heat varies considerably. Most insulating materials are really good insulators because they contain many small pockets of air. These small air spaces are poor conductors because the molecules of air are far apart compared to a solid, making it more difficult to pass the increased vibration motion from one molecule to the next. Metals, however, are good conductors as those of us who have touched hot metal have quickly learned. Air, conversely, is a very poor conductor of heat. The best insulator is a vacuum, since there are no molecules whatsoever to pass on the vibration motion. Wood and metal parts of your desk, so if you're sitting in a classroom desk, this is something I would say in class, um, so wood and metal parts of your desk have the same temperature, because they're in the same room with the same temperature, but they have this weird property where the metal will feel colder if you touch it. And that's because metal is a better conductor of heat than wood, and so it feels colder because it conducts heat from your fingers more quickly. Much of the heat transport that occurs in the atmosphere occurs via convection. Convection is the transfer of heat by mass movement or circulation within a substance. It takes place in fluids, that is, liquids like the ocean and gases like the air, where the atoms and molecules are free to move about. When molecules gain energy, they move more rapidly and push more vigorously against their surroundings, increasing the volume. Since the same amount of matter will now occupy a larger volume, the overall density has been decreased, and so the hotter air will rise, and vice versa, cooler air will sink. In a similar manner, most of the heat acquired in the lowest portion of the atmosphere by way of radiation and conduction is transferred upward by convection, like you see in the image on the right. For example, <clears throat> on a hot, sunny day, the air above a plowed field will be heated more than the air above the surrounding croplands. As warm, less dense air above the plowed field rises upward, it is replaced by the colder air above the croplands. In this way, a convective flow is established. This warm, what we call parcel of rising air, is called a thermal. Convection of this type not only transfers heat, but also transports moisture, that is water vapor, aloft, which may condense into clouds. The result is the increase in cloudiness that frequently can be observed on warm summer afternoons. Radiation is the transfer of heat in all directions by greater emission of radiant energy from the region of higher temperature. Radiant energy is energy associated with electromagnetic waves that move through space. So in our previous lecture, we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum briefly, but we'll revisit it here. The temperature of the object determines the rate, intensity, and kinds of radiant energy emitted. Unlike conduction and convection, which needs a medium to travel through, radiant energy travels readily through the vacuum of space. Thus, <clears throat> radiation is the heat transfer mechanism by which solar energy reaches the Earth. 19th century physicists were so puzzled by the seemingly impossible phenomenon of energy traveling through vacuums of space without a medium to transmit it that they assumed that a material, which they called an ether, must have existed between the Sun and Earth. You know that visible light is emitted if an object is heated to a certain temperature. A heating element on an electric stove, for example, will glow with a reddish-orange light when at the highest setting, 
but it produces no visible light at lower temperatures, although you feel warmth of your hand, or in your hand, when you hold it near. Your hand absorbs the non-visible radiant energy being emitted from the stovetop. The radiant energy does work on the molecules in your hand, giving them more kinetic energy, and you sense this as an increase in temperature or warmth. So these two images that I've included <clears throat> are just two other views of this electromagnetic spectrum that I gave in the previous lecture. So we see that there's lots of different types of electromagnetic radiation, from the most energetic of gamma rays, to x-rays, to ultraviolet radiation, to visible light, which is what we see, then we have infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. And the image on the right shows the exact same thing, just vertically. And in fact, I show another image of it here. The different energies of different forms of light explain many familiar effects in everyday life. Radio waves carry so little energy that they have no noticeable effects on our bodies. However, radio waves can make electrons move up and down in antennas, which is how you receive uh, radio waves coming from a radio station in your car. Molecules moving around in a warm object emit infrared light, which is why we sometimes associate infrared light with heat. Receptors in our eyes respond to visible light, making, vis making vision possible. Ultraviolet photons carry enough energy to harm cells in our skin, which can cause sunburn or even skin cancer, and is why we put sunscreen on. X-ray photons, or X-ray radiation, has enough energy to penetrate through the skin and muscle, but can be blocked by bones and teeth. This is why doctors and dentists can see our bone structures on photographs taken with X-ray light. Just as different colors of visible light may be absorbed or reflected differently by objects that we see, the various portions of the electromagnetic spectrum may interact in very different ways with other matter. For example, a brick wall is opaque to visible light. In other words, visible light doesn't pass through it. But it does transmit radio waves which is why radios and cell phones work inside buildings. Similarly, glass that is transparent to visible light might be opaque to UV radiation. In general, certain types of matter tend to interact more strongly with certain types of light, so each type of light carries different information about distant objects in the universe. So this is one reason why astronomers like to study all wavelengths of light. Okay, so there are a few basic laws that govern radiation. First of all, all objects at whatever temperature emit radiant energy. Hence, not only are hot objects, or excuse me, not only hot objects such as the sun, but also earth, including polar ice caps, are continually emitting energy. Next, hotter objects radiate more total energy per unit area than do colder objects. The sun, which has a surface temperature of nearly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, emits about 160,000 times more energy per unit area than does the Earth, which has an average temperature of about 59 Fahrenheit. Next up, hotter objects radiate more energy in the form of short wavelength radiation than do cooler objects. So in other words, this is just saying that it's more toward blue. So let me step back for just one moment, actually. So here we can see uh, the visible light. And so the shorter radiation or the more energetic things are more on the blue side. So if something is heating up, it's going to have more energy, which means it will be more blue. We can visualize this law by imagining a metal bar heated to white hot temperatures in a forge and then is allowed to cool. As it cools, it gradually dims and its color changes from white through yellow to red, as progressively more of its energy is radiated at longer wavelengths. Even when it is no longer glowing visibly, if you place your hand near the metal, the still longer infrared radiation can be detected as heat. We have one more. Objects that are good absorbers of radiation are good emitters as well. Earth's surface and the sun approach being what we call perfect radiators, because they absorb and radiate with almost 100% efficiency. On the other hand, gases are selective absorbers and radiators. 
Thus, the atmosphere, which is nearly transparent to certain wavelengths of radiation, is nearly opaque to others, which is how we got into the discussion in our last video on different layers of the Earth's atmosphere absorbing different energies. So, how can we put all this together and make it relatable? There's a lot of things going on here. Well, you can see these laws in action with a fireplace poker, or really any metal object that's heated up. While the poker is still relatively cool, it emits only infrared light, which we can't see. But as it gets hot, it begins to glow with more visible light. And its glow will be more bright, and this demonstrates the first law that we talked about, where you get more energy coming out of an object the hotter it gets. Its color demonstrates the next law. At first, it will start to glow a deep red hot, because red light has the longest wavelength of visible light. But as it gets even hotter, the average wavelength of the emitted photons will move toward the blue, shorter wavelengths. The mix of colors emitted at the higher temperatures makes the poker look white to your eyes, which is white hot rather than red hot. So basically, the hotter an object gets, the brighter it glows, and the more blue it becomes. We'll see why all of this is relevant soon. So light, now that we've discussed it, can interact with matter in four basic ways, all of which are familiar to everyday life. Emission is, for example, a light bulb, which emits visible light. This is the energy of light coming from an electric potential energy supplied by a light bulb. There's absorption, which you actually see in the middle of the figure that just popped up. When you place your hand near an incandescent light bulb, your hand absorbs some of the light, and this absorbed energy warms your hand. Materials that absorb light are called opaque. Transmission. Some forms of matter, such as glass or air, will transmit light, which means it allows it to pass through. Materials that transmit light are said to be transparent, and you can see that on the image on the right here. Many materials are neither perfectly transparent nor perfectly opaque. For example, dark sunglasses and clear eyeglasses are both partially transparent, but the dark glasses absorb more and transmit less light. Materials often interact differently with different colors of light. For example, red glass transmits red light but absorbs other colors, while a green lawn will reflect and scatter green light but it absorbs others. So, I have a pretty interesting video to link here, so pause the video and take a look at this. It shows one of the darkest materials that we've ever created. Okay, there's one other way that light can interact with matter, and that is reflection or scattering. Light can bounce off of matter, leading to what we call reflection when the bouncing is at the same general direction or scattering when it bounces in a more random fashion. A mirror reflects light along a simple path. The angle at which the light strikes the mirror is the same as the angle at which it is reflected. A movie screen scatters light in many different directions so that each member of the audience can watch the movie. The pages in a book do the same thing, which is why you can read them from different angles and distances. So let's put these ideas together to understand what happens when you walk into a room and turn on a light switch. The light bulb begins to emit white light, which is a mix of all colors in the spectrum. Some of this light exits the room, transmitted through the window. The rest of the light strikes the surfaces of objects that are inside the room, and the material properties of each object determines the colors it absorbs or reflects. The light coming from each object therefore carries an enormous amount of information about the object's location, shape, structure, and composition. You acquire this information when light enters your eyes, where special cells in your retina absorb it and send signals to your brain. Your brain interprets the messages that light carries, recognizes materials and objects in the room uh, in a process that we call vision. All the information that light brings us from the cosmos, for example, was encoded by the same four basic interactions between light and matter common to everyday experience. So, let's put all of this now to our discussion of Earth. I mean, this 
is earth science, so let's talk about what's going on on earth and why all of this is relevant. Well, this figure here shows the fate of incoming solar radiation averaged for the entire globe. Notice that the atmosphere is quite transparent to incoming solar radiation. On average, about 50% of the solar radiation that reaches the top of the atmosphere happens to get absorbed at Earth's surface. Another 30% is reflected back into space by the atmosphere, clouds, and reflective surfaces. The remaining 20% is absorbed by the clouds and atmospheric gases. So what determines whether solar radiation will be transmitted to the surface, scattered, reflected outward, or absorbed by the atmosphere? Well, as we will see, the answer depends greatly on the wavelength of the energy that's being transmitted, as well as on the nature of the intervening material. So, the idea here is 30% of all incoming light is reflected back into space, half of it is absorbed by the Earth. We've gone over this, but we're kind of putting it together with our atmospheric discussion, so we're going to recap a little. Reflection is a process where light bounces back from an object at the same angle at which it encountered a surface, and with the same intensity. By contrast, scattering is a general process in which radiation is forced to deviate from a straight trajectory. When a beam of light strikes an atom, a molecule, or a tiny particle in the atmosphere, it can spread out in all directions. Scattering disperses light both forward and backward. Whether solar radiation is reflected or scattered depends largely on the size of the intervening particles and the wavelength of the light. Energy is returned to space from Earth in two ways, by reflection and emission of radiant energy. The portion of solar energy that is reflected back to space leaves in the same short wavelengths from which it came. The fraction of the total radiation that is reflected by a surface is what's called the albedo, which is a Latin term for whiteness. About 30% of the solar energy that reaches the outer atmosphere is reflected back into space, as we just, as we just discussed. Thus, the albedo for Earth as a whole, which is its planetary albedo, is 30%. However, the albedo varies considerably both from place to place and from time to time, depending on the amount of cloud cover and particulate matter in the air, or even on the angle of the sun's rays and on the nature of the surface. A lower sun angle means that more atmosphere must be penetrated, thus making the, uh, uh, I guess, a longer obstacle course, and the loss of solar radiation is greater. So this figure here shows... Uh, the albedos for various surfaces. Note that the angle at which the sun rays strike the water surface are greatly affects how the albedo um, value changes. So water can range from 5 to 80% being reflected back. The energy that is not reflected is absorbed and heats the surface. If Earth did not, or excuse me, if Earth did nothing but absorb radiation from the sun, it would continuously get hotter and hotter until the surface temperature became high enough to melt rock. So it's a good thing that energy is reflected away. So basically, the darker your material, the more it's going to absorb, and the whiter your material, the more it's going to reflect. For example, asphalt, uh, only 5-10% to 10 is reflected away, but snow cover can be up to 90%. So here's a really interesting example, at least to me, but I'm kind of a nerd. Um, from just uh, January of this year, this is 2019, uh, we saw a huge polar vortex in which very, very cold air, in fact, record cold air, came down into the uh, American Midwest. So what we see here is on the left, the snowpack, a satellite image of the surface, and you can see that there's kind of a cutout here where no snow fell. And then if you look at temperatures at this time, you can see there's a huge change in temperature that almost matches that shape. Well, this is a direct example of the albedo at work, where it's a lot more white, energy is being reflected away, and so it's not being absorbed, and so it's very cold wherever there is snowpack. But in this small area, you see a slight warming. It's not much better. I mean, we're still looking at temperatures that appear to be in the negatives, but still, it's warmer than the surrounding areas because some energy is being absorbed by the darker land, and so it heats the surface a little bit more. So I just think this is a really cool example of something fairly recent. 
Although incoming solar radiation travels in a straight line, small dust particles and gas molecules in the atmosphere scatter some of this energy in all directions. The result, called diffused light, explains how light reaches into the area beneath the shade of a tree and how a room is lit in the absence of direct sunlight. Further, scattering accounts for the brightness and even the blue color of the daytime sky. In contrast, bodies such as the moon and Mercury, which are without atmospheres, have dark skies and pitch black shadows, even during daylight hours. Overall, about half of the solar radiation that is absorbed at Earth's surface arrives as diffused or scattered light. So here's a view of the moon from Earth and the Earth from the moon. Notice the sky is blue because of diffused light, light that's being scattered around in the atmosphere, and on the moon, it's pitch black. The sky is completely dark because there's no atmosphere for the light to be bouncing around in. So we don't have diffused light there. So this might lead some people to question, well, okay, so we get light on in, in this way, but why is it blue? And why are sunsets red and orange? Well, most visible sunlight reaches the ground and warms the surface, but a small amount is scattered and has two important effects. First, scattering makes the daytime sky bright, which is why we can't see many stars in the daytime. Without scattering, sunlight would travel only in perfectly straight lines, which means we'd see the sun against an otherwise black sky like we see on the moon. Scattering also prevents shadows from, uh, on Earth from being pitch black. Second, scattering explains why our sky is blue. Visible light consists of all the colors of the rainbow, but not all of the colors are scattered equally. Gas molecules scatter blue light, much more efficiently than red light. The difference in scattering is so great that for practical purposes, we can imagine that only the blue light gets scattered. So when the sun is overhead, this scattered blue light reaches our eyes from all directions, and so it appears to be blue. At sunset or sunrise, like you see on the left of this image, the sunlight has to pass through a greater amount of atmosphere before it reaches us. So as a result, most of the blue light is scattered completely away before it reaches our eyes, leaving behind a more red light. And that's why sunsets tend to be this orangish red color. So we're going to finish this discussion. I mean, this whole section is called heating the atmosphere. So let's really talk now about how we keep this heat. So radiation comes down to the surface and heats it, but how do we keep it? Well, the Earth is warmer than it is predicted to be caused by the sun's radiation. The explanation for this discrepancy is the greenhouse effect. So how does the greenhouse effect work? And this is extremely important, even not even just because, you know, it's a science class and I want you to learn this. Just as human beings, you need to understand how this works. Sunlight arrives at Earth. Roughly 30% of sunlight is immediately reflected by the clouds and the surface, but that other 69 to 70% is absorbed by the surface of the Earth, which heats the surface. The now heated surface will then emit this as infrared radiation, or heat. Some of this radiation leaks back into space, but the rest is trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, heating both the atmosphere and the surface below. The net result is that the greenhouse gases tend to slow the escape of infrared radiation from the lower atmosphere, where their molecules are in motion that heat the surrounding air. In this way, the greenhouse effect makes the surface and the lower atmosphere warmer than they would be from sunlight alone. The more greenhouse gas is present, the greater the degree of surface warming. The best way to think about this, especially considering it's very cold out at the time of recording this, so if you're watching this recently uh, from the upload, you'll know what I'm talking about. Think of a blanket. You stay warm under a blanket, not because the blanket itself is providing heat, but because it's trapping or slowing the escape of your body heat into the cold outside air. So, this is the same idea. Uh, the warming caused by the greenhouse effect gives our planet the moderate temperatures needed for the existence of life. But for more than a century, our technological civilizations have been adding more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate. In other words, we're adding more and more blankets on top of us. We're trapping the heat more and more. And this is a problem. 
just to give you an idea, and we'll only look at this quickly, um, but we're going to revisit this when we get to our astronomy lectures at the end of the course. But here's three different um, solar system bodies. We have the moon on the left, Earth here in the middle, and Venus on the right. The moon, as we mentioned, has no atmosphere, so there's no greenhouse gases. As a result, almost all of that incoming radiation is lost right back into space, and so the surface is relatively cool. Here on Earth, we just discussed, we have a greenhouse effect, so some of that heat is trapped. But Venus, our closest planet and sister planet, is about the same size, but there's tons of clouds on the surface, or above the surface, and it has mostly carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. So it's got a very thick and dense atmosphere. In other words, it has a ton of blankets above it. And as a result, any of that solar radiation that does make it to the surface gets trapped there for a very long time. And so its surface is baked to almost 950 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absurd. So let us conclude now with some questions. Question number one. When you pick up a hot pan off the stove without protecting your hands, the heat that you feel has been transferred to you by what? The answer here is, if I can find my arrow key, there we go, conduction. Conduction is the transfer of heat through matter. According to our laws of radiation, hotter objects will do what? All right. The answer here is B. They will emit more energy than colder objects. In other words, the hotter something gets, the more brightly it tends to glow, or the more luminous it is. And question three. The albedo of the Earth as a whole is what? So again, albedo is the whiteness, basically, how much is being reflected back away. And so we should find that the Earth's albedo as a whole is about 30%. All right, last but not least, question four. The greenhouse effect refers to what? All right, the answer here is B. It is the ability of the atmosphere to transmit solar energy, but block the escape of heat energy from the Earth's surface. This is the greenhouse effect. And this is the conclusion of this lecture. So, as always, thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.